Hello everyone, this is Paul Hill from ITFlee.com and in this video I'm going to be getting you exposure to the IT field. Now this is a beginner level training so if, if you're advanced, you already have an IT job, you work in the IT field all the time, this video is not targeted towards you. So this is for people who don't know much about the IT field but want to learn the basics. All right, And what I'm going to be teaching you is we're going to be downloading a virtual box and building a virtual environment. Uh, we're going to be installing Windows Server 2012 R2, okay? And this is all going to be done from your home computer and for free. You're not going to have to pay for anything. Everything in this video is free. So what I want, what my goal is, is that when, a lot of times when you're trying to get into the IT field, you don't have experience and you don't know where to start. You don't know what to do to get experience and therefore you can't get a job because employers are looking for people with experience. Well, this course in this video particularly is going to give you exposure and experience with Windows Server 2012. Now, I, on my website, uh, itflea.com, this is all, I have the course on here as well. You don't have to go on the website though. You can just watch the video here on YouTube. And this, my site is just focused. All I do is help people get IT jobs and advance their IT careers if they already have them. Uh, but this course in particular is for people that don't know anything about IT and just want to get started. So if you have any questions, uh, you can go on my site and contact me. Also subscribe to my site, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and please like this uh this video if it helps you out at all. So I'm going to quit talking now. We're going to get right into it. We're going to build some virtual machines, install Windows Server 2012, and, and uh, get some basic IT experience. So I hope this training helps you guys, and I will see y'all later. A virtual machine or VM is an emulation of a physical computer. Basically, you're running a computer within a computer. Here are some of the advantages to this technique. You'll notice in this example, we only have one physical host, the desktop computer. This means potentially we're using less electricity, outputting less heat, which that's important in data center environments, and thus being more environmentally friendly. We also didn't have to pay for computer hardware or other accessories like monitors, keyboards, mice for each of the VMs. We simply use the host attached devices. We can also clone these virtual machines very quickly and make backups if necessary. And since these machines are virtual, we can send them electronically across the world without having to pay to ship 60 pound servers. So virtual technology is very commonly used and it's something that you're going to have to be familiar with. You need to understand how virtual machines work. So continue on to the next lectures and you'll grasp an understanding of how to build the VMs and how to operate them. So I'll see you in the next lectures. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and download our software that's going to manage our virtual machines. So the software is called VirtualBox. So we're going to go to www.virtualbox.org. Okay, so it's pre-filled for me, so I'm going to hit enter. All right, we're going to click on this download section over here. And we're going to download VirtualBox 5.0.10 for Windows hosts. Now this version, it could be different for you. Uh, if it sets a different version, it's not a big deal. So we'll just click the x86 slash AMD and we'll hit save okay it'll view this download all right and we will just wait for this to finish downloading okay so that has gone ahead and downloaded so i'm going to click run all right bring this over here so we're going to click next and we're just going to go ahead and leave all these options checked and we'll select next again. Uh, I'm not going to create one on the quiz launch bar. You can leave that there if you want. And we're going to want to register file associations and we're going to want to create a desktop shortcut. That's fine. We'll say yes. Install. Okay, so we got that installing now. It's asking me, would you like to install device drivers or device software? Now we're going to want to go ahead and say yes, install. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and say start Oracle VM VirtualBox after installation. So leave that checked and click finish. All right, and there we go. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and close out of this web browser and I'm going to take my shortcut and I'm going to stick it over here on the desktop. So now that we got this installed, we're ready to go ahead and download Server 2012. So I'll see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to learn how to manage and create virtual machines using Oracle VM VirtualBox. So the first thing we need to do is start up VirtualBox. And once that comes up, we can see this was where all of our VMs will be listed. 
Now you can see I have a group here and within that group I have two VMs, one's a domain controller and one's just a Windows 10 workstation. Now you're not going to have any of that because I created all that in another course, another Udemy course that I teach. So what to create a new VM what we're going to do is click the new button in the top left corner. And this is where we'll name the virtual machine. Now this is just the name of the virtual machine relating to VirtualBox. This isn't actually the computer name of the virtual machine. So I'm just going to name this Test Virtual Machine. Okay. And for whatever reason it thinks it's going to be Linux when I type in Test Virtual. I don't know what's up with that. But I'm going to change over to Windows. And uh, I'm going to do Server 2012 64-bit. Now if you don't have a 64-bit computer you can do you know Windows uh, 7 32-bit or Windows 8 32-bit or just pick one of these 32-bit operating systems like Windows 10. Uh, you can actually download Windows 10 for free. Uh, so if you need to, you can do something like that. Okay, and then there's also, as a side note, there's also Ubuntu, which you can download for free, and we'll get more into that in, uh, further down the course. So I'm going to click Next, and this is where we specify the amount of random access memory or RAM. And it's specified in megabytes, so it's not 2,000 gigabytes. Uh, so 2048 is 2 gigs. That's good enough for what we need. So I'm just going to click Next. You can create the virtual hard disk now, which is what we're going to do. Or you can use an existing hard disk file. of, And you can see here they have the other two virtual machines listed. I could use those hard disk files. Uh, not really a good idea for what I need right now. You can also create the virtual machine without a hard disk file. Uh, which is also not really a good idea for what we're trying to do at this point in time, which is create a virtual machine and get it running. So we'll create the virtual hard disk now. Click Create. And this is where we select the format. Now we're going to choose VDI. And you can choose these other formats that are compatible with different software. The VMDK you can use with VMware and uh, so forth. But the VDI is fine for what we're going to do. Now to choose either dynamically allocated or fixed size, it's a pretty simple choice and you pretty much want to do dynamically allocated. The only time you want to choose fixed size is when you're really concerned about never running out of hard drive space and filling up your VMs to the max. So if you're creating, if you want to create five virtual machines and you know they're going to be create, filled up to the max then you might want to choose a fixed size hard disk. But the difference is if you choose dynamically allocated and you want to have a 50 gigabyte hard drive Dynamically allocated will create a hard disk file that's as small as it can be, which I believe is 2 megabytes, and it's going to fill up to 50 gigabytes as you use the operating system, as you install software, etc. If you choose a fixed size, then the hard drive is just going to be 50 gigabytes no matter how much is actually on the VM. So dynamically allocated makes sense for what we're trying to do. Okay, click next. Now this is where we actually set the size of the hard drive since we chose dynamically allocated. This is the maximum size that the hard disk file can take up on our host machine and the maximum size that the hard disk can appear on the VM. So when someone goes in onto this VM and they go to my computer, they're going to see your hard disk size is 25 gigabytes. So we'll click create. That's good enough for us. And here we can see that it dropped it into this other group here, which I don't want. So I'm just going to drag it outside the group. I'm going to minimize this group. I'm going to right click on this VM and I'm going to create a new group and I'm just going to call it actually I have to right click again and select rename group and I'm just going to call this test group there we go so now we have we're all we're all organized we have w to me domain and we have test group so I'm not going to be confused I'm not going to be clicking on the wrong VM or doing anything silly like that I can right click on the VM and I have settings I can clone the VM I can remove the VM which if I click that it'll ask me do I want to delete all files or remove only. Difference is this will actually clear it off of the hard disk. This and remove only will only clear it from the inventory. All right, so it'll just take it so we can't see it here anymore. I'm just going to click cancel because I want to keep this. And uh, I'm going to right click. Uh, actually, one more thing. If I click on show and explore, it'll pop it up here. And here you can see the test virtual machine VDI file. This is the virtual disk image and it's two megabytes like I thought it was. I was right. Two megabytes. So if we set this to fixed size, then this hard disk file would be 25 gigabytes, even though we don't have any files stored in the hard drive yet. Okay? So these are our VirtualBox machine files. Just leave all those and we'll close out of this. Okay, so I'm going to right click and I'm going to select settings because what we need to do at this point is mount the Windows Server 2012 
ISO or whatever operating system you want to install, you'll get the CD and, or the disk image in an ISO format. Usually it's how you get it. I'm going to select that ISO file and I'm going to mount it so I can launch and boot to that disk. Now under general we have different settings uh, that w I don't think we'll I don't think we'll care to change any of these. I don't I'm not worried about encryption. Uh, you this you might want to change the memory if uh, you find it's too slow. You can change this boot order. That's very very handy. Uh, VirtualBox does not allow you to boot to an external hard drive. So if you bring in a USB drive, you can't plug it into your computer and boot to it. it does not allow it. But you can raise the uh, processors different things like that um, you know diff there's different settings in here that you're probably not gonna ever mess with now what we need to do is click on this little disk icon where it says empty and we'll select this drop down and I've already these are files that I've recently used so you're not gonna have any of these listed more than likely now what you need to do is click choose virtual optical disk file and you'll browse to wherever you downloaded your ISO file so you can choose DMG uh, or ISO or CDR file now I'm just going to cancel because I already have it listed here and for whatever reason Microsoft likes to make these really complicated names this is basically Windows Server 2012 so I'm just going to click on WinBlue refresh blah 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 okay now one more thing that I might want to point out to you is under network this is attached to a NATed adapter and the only thing that you really need to know is that if you want to change, if you want your virtual machines to communicate to each other, which we will at a later point, you'll want to change this to internal network. But for our purposes right now, we want to leave this at NAT. Okay? So we'll click OK. All right, so the virtual machine has been configured. We can see a quick overview at a glance of the settings. There's our Windows 10, or I'm sorry, Windows Server 2012 ISO is mounted. We see it has two gigs of RAM. You can just browse down and look at these different settings. And we are done. That is how you create and manage a virtual machine. So I will see you in the next lecture. All right, in this lecture, we're going to go ahead and download Server 2012. So I'm going to go ahead and start Internet Explorer. Okay, and we're just going to search for, uh, let's see, Windows Server 2012, and we'll just do R2 download, okay? And it says right here, try Windows Server 2012 R2. Okay, we'll click there. All right, so it brought us straight down to it. It's pretty smart. The website's pretty smart. So it dropped us right down to Server 2012 R2. There's a 180-day evaluation download that's available for free now you just need to register that's it so I've already registered so I'm gonna go ahead and sign in so I will drag this off screen that way there's no personal data exposed okay so I've went ahead and logged in now we're gonna to want to choose the ISO as the file type so we're gonna say register to continue Okay, and I'm just going to leave all this blank so you can't see any of this information. I'm just I'm going to click continue. Okay, just keep clicking continue through the screens. Click that again. Am I not filling something out? No, okay, this is just slow. All right, so we're going to go for this long file name down here at the bottom, okay? It's the wind blue refresh, uh, you know, 143.17, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So it's 64 bit. So we're going to go ahead and click download. And it's 4.22 gigabytes. And we're going to click save. Okay. All right. And now we're going to wait for this to download. All right. So the download is completely finished. Now I am storing it on a, ex uh, not an external, but a second hard drive. So I'm not going to drag it to my desktop. So here's the file. It's completely downloaded 4.22 gigabytes and we are ready to start installing server 2012. So I will see you in the next lecture. Okay. So in this lecture, we're going to install windows server 2012. So the first thing we need to do uh, is power on the virtual machine and you can see right here we already have the ISO mounted so we'll go ahead right click and say start normal start okay the VM window appears here
Now we can do right control and F and that'll bring up full screen on a virtual machine. Now we're doing English, US, United States, click next. We'll select install now. Okay, so let's expand this and take a look at what our options are here. Now, like I said before, it's all 64-bit for Windows Server. Now, we can install server core installation or server with the GUI and their standard and data center. Uh, basically, the difference is how many licenses you can apply. Uh, it's basically purchase and volume options. Uh, we're just going to pick data center and we're going to do server with a GUI. Now, server core does not come with all, I like pretty obvious, it doesn't come with all the GUI options. So it runs faster and it Microsoft's really pushing sysadmins to code, kind of go this way and manage the server cores from one server with a GUI. So you'll have maybe five Windows servers and four of them will be server core and then one will be server with a GUI. You manage the four servers with a core from the one server that you have with a GUI. That's where they're pushing the the kind of direction. If you take uh, the MCSA exam, you'll find this, that that's what they're recommending. But uh, we're just going to do server with a GUI and click next. Okay, accept the license terms. Now we're going to select custom and we're going to install Windows only. And it says advanced. I don't really know why it says that. Um, the other option is to upgrade and we don't have anything installed, so we have to choose custom. Now we're going to choose drive zero and we don't have anything on here. You can see it's got free 25 gigabytes. If there was data on here, we could click format and just wipe out the data, but uh, we don't need to do any of that. So we'll go ahead and click next. Now we just need to wait for Windows Server to finish its installation. All right, so this is where we're going to set the password for the local administrator account. Now you can see the username there is administrator. It's not admin. It's full, fully spelled administrator. And I'm going to go ahead and create my password. You might want to write this down or use a password that you'll remember because if you forget it, you're going to be in a little bit of trouble. You have to rebuild or reinstall Windows. So I'm going to click finish. All right, so now we can log in. So on VirtualBox, if I hit right control and delete, it's the same as pressing control delete. If I actually press control delete, it'll lock my Windows host. So, or it won't lock it, it'll bring up the uh, task screen. So I'm gonna log in with the password I just created. All right, so we're prompted about this network. Uh, do you wanna find PCs, devices, content on this network? I'm just gonna say yes, I don't really care. Okay, and now we have server manager. We'll go into more detail on this later. So what we want to do now is go ahead and pop out of full screen mode and we need to install the VirtualBox tools. So the way you do that is click on devices and click insert guest additions CD image. Okay, so we're going to scroll down. All right, and here's the disk. We'll pop this open and then we'll select next. Install and this allows things like copying from one computer from your host into the VM, uh, clipboard sharing, and things like that. And also drag and drop onto the desktop. Okay, so it wants us to reboot. We'll just say we'll reboot later. All right, so we'll close out of that. And we are all done with this lecture. We have Server 2012 installed. We've installed the guest editions, and that's it for this lecture. So I will see you guys in the next lecture. All right, so in this lecture, I'm going to teach you how to rename your server. So let's right click on the server and we're going to click start and normal start. So now that it's powered on, I'm going to hit right control and hit F and that'll bring it into full screen mode. And I have server manager here. So if you don't see server manager, you can click down here on the left and pop it up. Also, make sure you're on the local server tab on the left and not under the dashboard. Otherwise, you won't see this information. And right here under computer name, I'm going to click on this little blue text here. Okay, so I'm going to drag this to the middle of the screen so I can see what's going on. Now we can see the full computer name is this Windows and then some random string. And then we can see the work group. Now I'm going to click change. And here you can set it to be a member of a domain if you've set up a domain on your local network. Or you can set it to a work group. If you haven't set up a domain or you don't know what a domain is, then you don't want to set it to this setting. Although it's really, it would be good for you to look into how to set up a domain and uh, that'd be really valuable experience. So you might want to chase that, chase that down. 
Uh, I teach a course on that, uh, by the way, if you want to look into it or learn more about it. So under the computer name, I'm going to change it to just T serve and I'm just going to call it 2012. So stands for test server 2012, something I just made up. You can make up whatever you want. Generally, in enterprise environments, I see server names being named after the airport code, uh, whatever role they're taking on. So if it's a domain controller, it'll be named like DC 101, or if it's an update server, it might be called US 101 or something like that. So I'm going to go with TServe 2012. So I know it's a 2012 server, and I know it's a test server. Okay, so I'm going to click OK. Okay, it's going to ask me to restart. I'm going to click close and then I'll be prompted to restart. So I'm going to say restart now. Okay, so let's log back in and let's make sure that it changed the computer name. Okay, so it's booting up. Here comes server manager. Now let's click on local server. And here we can see computer name is tServe2012. All right, so that wraps up this lecture. Great job, and I'll see you in the next one. All right, now it's time for us to learn how to check for operating system updates or Windows updates. So let's click on the Windows button, and we'll go over to Control Panel. And we're, you see this view by up here in the top right? We're going to right click on the category. I'm sorry, left click. And we're going to choose small icons. And this just gives us more options. It's, it's more like the uh, old Windows 7 or, or XP uh, control panel. So we'll click in the bottom right corner, Windows Updates, use your, your last option. And once that comes up, we can see here that we've never checked for updates, we've never installed updates, and we're receiving updates for Windows only. So what we're going to do is we're going to click on the left here, and we're going to say check for updates. Okay. And this, since it's the first time, it's going to take quite a while to run. So we're going to let this run and we'll check back in a few minutes. All right, so it's done checking for updates and we can see we have 180 important updates and 29 optional updates. So if we look over here at the optional updates, we can see what these are. So if we wanted to see more information about any of these vulnerabilities, we can click on the more information button. But before we do that, uh, we haven't set up our web browser configuration yet and what I mean by that is we need to turn off enhanced security okay so click over here on server manager and click on local server okay so IE enhanced security configuration it's turned on basically this is gonna pop up and ask us to add in a security exception for any kind of different website that we try to visit so what I need to do is click on the on button here and we want to turn it off for administrators Okay, so there's administrators and there's regular users. We're going to select off for administrators and we're going to click OK. Okay, so IE enhanced security configuration is turned off. So now if we wanted to see more information, we could click this button right here. It'll bring open Internet Explorer. And this is just telling us that protected mode is turned off. We're just going to ignore that and say don't show this message again. All right, here we go. So virtual machines do not respond to your operations and blah, 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 blah. Okay, this is the first time I've used Internet Explorer, so it's asking me. I'm just going to say recommended settings. So you can read more about the vulnerability cause, resolution, and etc. So you can see the KB number is listed here. So if you wanted to, you can look up any number that you wanted. You just type it in after the KB in the URL. So this is KB 31336881, and we're looking at 33, or I'm sorry, 31336881. Okay and close out of that. And we could do the same for each one of these updates if we wanted to. And same goes for important updates. Uh, you know, the, a lot of times these are security updates to keep you from getting hacked or getting viruses on your computer, etc. Anything that makes the operating system vulnerable. So we have 179 updates like this. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click install. All right, so it's gonna download the updates and we'll just wait for that to finish. All right, so it's done installing the updates. So it wants us to reboot. So we'll go ahead and do that. All right, so now we're going to log in and check on these updates. So hit right control and delete. Type in our administrator password. Okay, so we'll click start, control panel, Windows updates. All right, so if we go to check for updates, 
I'm sorry, if we go to view update history, we can view these are all the updates that were installed. Okay. So we'll go back. And there's three more important updates, 29 optional updates. If we wanted to go in, we could go in and install those updates. I don't believe it's necessary. So that concludes this lecture. I'll see you in the next one. Okay, so now we're going to learn how to manage local user accounts on our server. So what we're going to do is we're going to click over here in the bottom left corner on the Windows button, and we're going to go to Control Panel. Next, we're going to click on User Accounts, and we're going to click on User Accounts again. Now let's click on Manage Another Account. Okay, so here we can view all the accounts. So we have a guest account, which is turned off at the at the moment and then we have the administrator account which is this is the account that we set up when we installed the operating system now if we wanted to turn on the account we can select it and we can choose turn on or we can just leave it off okay or we can add a new user account so we'll click down here in the bottom left I'm gonna name this test and I'm gonna create a password it has to be a secure password you can't use a password like test or you know ABCD one two three or something like that it might work I don't think it will uh, and then you need to type in a pass password hint. So I'll just type in hint because I don't really care. I'm going to click next. Okay, so we're going to add the following user. Click finish. And notice it says local account. Okay. Versus local being versus domain account. All right, so now we have the account here. And we can select it. We can choose. We can change the name. We can change the password. We can change the account type, which basically from a standard user to administrator, someone who can make changes to the PC versus someone who can't. Uh, we're just going to click cancel. All right, or we can click manage another account. So let's go ahead and let's test out our test account. So I'm going to hit right control and delete. And I'm going to select switch user. Okay, I hit right control and delete again. And you can see the account appears here in the list. So I'm going to click test. I'm going to type in the password I created for this account. All right, so it brings us to our desktop. So if we click here, we can see that our account is test in the top right. And if we go under control panel, for example, and we'll go to uninstall programs, let's just right click on this and say uninstall. Continue. And you can see that it prompts us under user account control for an administrator password. This is because we created this user account as a standard account, so we cannot uninstall or reinstall programs, okay? So the standard account is more restricted than the administrator account. So we're done here. Let's just click the start button, select the name, and click sign out, okay? Now let's log back into our administrator account. Okay, so this pops back up. So we can see the difference is that this has this is an administrator account and this is not. So if we wanted to change this to administrator, we just click there and choose administrator account, then it would be able to do all the other functions that the administrator default administrator account can do. Now you could just type in the administrator account password and you would be able to use this account as a standard account. Some uh, some security policies will require you to use what they call elevated permissions. And it's where you log into a standard account, like our test account. And then when you need to do an administrative action, you type in the username and password of your administrator account. Okay, just all options that you have. So let's go ahead and click on the test account and let's delete it. So click delete the account. And here we can choose whether we want to keep these files or delete the user's files. And in our case, we don't need to keep any of its you know, favorites, pictures, or anything like that. So we're just going to click Delete Files. And it's going to ask us again, are you sure you want to delete the account? We'll click Yes. Or we'll click Delete Account, sorry. Oops. Okay, there we go. So that's how you manage accounts on Windows Server 2012. In this lecture, I'm going to show you how to manage Windows features and roles on Server 2012. So I'm going to right click on the virtual machine. I'm going to click Settings. And what we need to do first is mount the ISO that we use to install the operating system. So select Storage, click on the disk drive here, and we'll click the drop down and we're going to select the WinBoo Refresh. Okay. Now check the Live CD slash DVD checkbox and click OK. All right, so now we want to show the virtual machine. So right click and do Show. 
and I'm going to hit right control and F to bring it into full screen. All right, so we can see the message up there in the top right saying the disk is mounted and we can verify it by opening Windows Explorer and we can see the disk right there. So now we'll close that. And now what we can do is we can either click here, add roles and features, or we can click manage add roles and features. Doesn't matter which one you click. Okay, so it's just a little welcome screen. All right, we're gonna do a role-based or feature-based installation. Okay, so click next. And this is a server pool. We only have one server on, on this network. Um, so we're just gonna click test serve 2012, whatever you named your server, we'll click next. And here we can add in any of these features. Now I recommend that you go through and just add different features and see what they do. Try to learn how to work with them. I teach an entire course on Active Directory Domain Services. There's a lot that goes into each of these little uh, check boxes here. It's not like you don't just check a box, click next, and then you're done. There's a lot that goes into it. So, uh, but you can definitely learn about it. Like if you Google setting up a DNS server, uh, you'll come up with different tutorials and, and different things where you can learn how to set this stuff up. Uh, so what we're going to add is we're going to go to the very bottom and we're going to choose Windows Server Essentials Experience. Okay. The only reason we're picking this is so that you can understand how you add roles and features. So it's going to pop up and it's going to say that if you want to add this role, you need to add these amount of features. So these features are all, or this, I'm sorry, this role is dependent on all of these features. So we'll click the add features button. So automatically add those features. We'll click next. And at this point, we can go ahead and choose additional features if we want them, but we don't. So we'll just click next. Okay. We're going to select next again. Keep clicking next. You can read these screens if you're interested. And then here's more role services. Just click next. Now on this confirmation screen, we need to specify the disk that we mounted, the server 2012 installation disk. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type or I'm going to click on specify an alternate source path. Okay, and this is where we can type in or we can enter the alternate source path. Basically what we're doing, the installation files for these roles and features are not stored on the server. They're stored on the installation disk. So open Windows Explorer, right click on this thing, I'm sorry, right click on the CD and click open and we'll go to sources and SXS. Okay, now this is the path that we need to specify. So right click up here in the navigation bar and right click say copy. And we can close this window. We're done with it. And right here in this path, we're going to right click and say paste. Click OK. All right. So now we're ready to install it. So we'll click install. All right. So the feature is done installing. So I'm going to click on close. And we see up here we have notifications. Let's click on this notification. And it's asking us to do the post deployment configuration. So let's go ahead and click configure Windows Server Essentials. So here we can type in a company name and I'm just going to type in uh, IT Flea. That's the name of my website. And we will just go ahead and click next. So now I'm going to make an administrator account name and I'm just going to use Paul H. And I'll just make up the password here. All right. Click configure. So now it's going to prepare our server. So we're going to let this run. And then once it's complete, we'll check back. All right. So the post deployment configuration is complete. I had to reboot the workstation and now I'm just going to log back in. And first thing I want you to notice is that before administrator says it flea, and that's the name of our domain. So I'm going to go ahead and log into the account. All right. Now I'm going to open server manager and you can see we have the little, uh, the dashboard for windows server essentials on the desktop. You can open that if you're interested. And we have these new tools here on the side. And if we click up here on tools, we have different tools like Active Directory using computer sites and services and so forth. Uh, so I'll just pop open Active Directory using computers. This is a, a major technology that you want to get your, hand, your head wrapped around. You want to understand how to use this. You can right click, make a new user account, and then log into it. Uh, I have another course that goes pretty deep into Active Directory. Uh, so you can check that out if you're interested. Uh, of course, group policy management is another major technology that you need to understand how to use. Uh, so you can right click on your domain and create GPOs and do different, like change the desktop background, um, change, you know, different various settings on the computer. 
So, yep, that's it. Um, last thing that I might want to show you is if you want to remove a feature, you click Manage and click Remove Roles and Features. Click Next. Select Next because we're changing this local server. And then under Server Roles, what you do is just uncheck the box and you'd select Remove Features and it would go through the uninstall process. You'd have to reboot and pretty much repeat the exact same steps that you chose before. So I'll click Cancel, Cancel. And that is how you manage features and roles on Windows Server 2012. I'll see you in the next lecture. Okay, in this lecture, we're going to cover Event Viewer and Windows Logs. So on Server 2012, one way to start Event Viewer is to click on Tools and then select Event Viewer right here in the list. If you're on another operating system, such as Windows 7 or Windows 10 or Windows 8, you can also type in, excuse me, type that right, Event Viewer, and then click it that way, okay? So Event Viewer is not something that's restricted to just Server 2012 or Server 2008 or 2003, etc. Now, when let me explain how this works and what this is. Basically, when something happens, when you go to install a program on a Windows operating system, it creates what are called logs. And these logs are stored in Event Viewer. Or to be more specific, they can be viewed through Event Viewer. So if you, someone restarts your computer remotely, it'll be tracked in Event Viewer. If you clear the audit log, it'll be tracked in Event Viewer. If you uninstall a program, it'll be tracked. If there's an error, then it'll also be logged in Event Viewer. Okay, so this first little tab right here, we can create custom views, but we're not very interested in that. We're not gonna create any of these custom views, so we're just gonna ignore that. And we're gonna go right to Windows Logs. Now we have Application Logs, which will give us uh, application level logs, just like it says, it's pretty simple. Uh, we can click through here and you can see the software protection services started. Um, you can click through here and just look. It's a lot of uh, information that you're going to have to Google because you might not know, if you're new to computers, you might not know what SVC host does. There's all this different information and you don't generally just come through and browse through Event Viewer. Generally, you'll have some kind of problem. You'll try to install a program or a Windows feature and it'll air out. It'll fail. At that point, you would go to Event Viewer and you would say, okay, I tried to install the program at 7.56 a.m. and it failed. So you would go to your logs and you would look for your logs at 7.56 a.m. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and look at security. Now, we have two types under security. We have audit success and audit failures. Now, here we can see that, let's just look at this real quick. An account was logged off. All right, so let's we can scroll down in this little pane here and just see the details. Now, the account name was tserv2012 with the dollar sign at the end. That is the local computer account, okay? So nothing big here, nothing wrong, uh, nothing to worry about. It's just saying that the account has successfully logged off. Now, let's see if I can find where we actually log in. Don't know if I'll be able to find that because there's so many logs in here. And you can see up here, it says number of events, 44,000, and then it has an exclamation mark. That means there's new events. So if I press F5, now I have all the latest events. Now the second, as you can see, it's already happened. A new log was just created, and I have to refresh again. So 44,755 logs. In a second, there'll be more new logs. And uh, it just kind of keeps going and going and going, and it'll overwrite. See, we got more new logs again. So a lot of times... If you're into the information assurance field or counter hacking, you'll be going through the security logs and you'll be looking for what's called uh, audit failures. And I'll sort this so I can try and get these at the top. This might take a second. So we can just look through these different things. If we wanted to look up this code, we can Google that code. It'll probably return some results. It doesn't always. Sometimes you'll run into this really ambiguous or obscure error and you won't be able to find information on it. But generally, you can look up these return codes and find out exactly what's going on. There's a task category. The level is information. Uh, so, you know, we can go through here. There's another log on. So, so, something failed to log on. Again, the computer account, for whatever reason, failed to log on. There's a log on ID there. And then we'll have the same, uh, sorry, substatus. But you can look up these, uh, these status codes, or you can Google this substatus code and try and figure out exactly what is causing the issue. And then you would also want to include that it's lsass.exe, lsass. So 
you can just browse through this information and we have the setup which this is mostly in here it's all the Windows updates that I installed so you can just see that Windows Event Viewer is just it basically tracks everything that happens on the computer uh, nobody just browses through this stuff no one looks at this unless they're looking for something specific whether it's you know a hacker intruding your system you might want to look for you know failed logon attempts or something like that and there's a lot of software that costs thousands and thousands of dollars that will uh, grab all these logs and put them into an interface that's a lot easier to read like for example uh, uh, we've used GFI events manager where that we would have 500 workstations and it would go to all those workstations and grab all the security logs and then we'd be able to review them for all of our workstations and it would sort and say hey this user failed to log in you know five times in a row and it just gives you hints on if there's a brute force attack on your network and different things like that uh, but if you don't have software like that then you're stuck with event viewer which is much more difficult to sort through the information so we can see that this is you know the update number that installed it was successful target state installed uh, we have some system logs that we could look through. Uh, the Windows Update Services entered the running state. So if you're troubleshooting something at 7:04 a.m., you're like, "Man, I don't think the update services uh, the update service started." Well, you can go through the logs and you can find it here and say, "Okay, it did start." So we have information level, and then we have by sort we have let's see errors and warnings under application. Uh, you can sort through all these and try. You're always going to have errors happen. Uh, these errors are just happening on their own. I haven't done anything to generate these errors, so you're always going to have some errors. So I wouldn't worry about the errors showing up in the logs unless something is breaking. So if you're trying to complete something and it's not working, then it's time to come through here and find, okay, let's see if I have, if I have any errors or warning messages or anything like that. So to clear a log, you can right-click and say clear log, and it'll ask you if you want to save the logs before you want to clear it and it'll save it to some type of log file but we can just click clear and now we don't have any events so if we do this under security clear log and say clear it leaves one log in here saying the event the audit log was cleared by IT fee slash administrator that's the account that I'm logged into right now okay so that's how you work with event viewer that's how uh, that's the purpose of event viewer and I hope that gives you some information um, if you're if you basically if you run into a problem and you're not getting a good error that you can Google or something like that it's kind of obscure then you need to open event viewer and you need to start digging in it's not much fun it's very tedious but uh, it'll definitely get the job done and definitely tell you what's going on with your network so all right good job and I will see you in the next lecture in this lecture, I want to introduce you to batch scripts. Now, this is going to be a very basic overview, and I could really make a whole course on uh, batch scripting, but I just want to get your feet wet and let you know that uh, you can make batch scripts and how to do them. Uh, and that way, you can kind of take the lead with it and just learn more about it on your own. So maybe I can make a course about it later if you guys ask me to, or I can add more info uh, to this course about batch scripting if you're interested. Uh, so let's go ahead and just hit the Windows key and let's open command prompt. So we can type in commands right here. So we can list the directory by typing dir. Uh, we can make directories using mkdir. So we can just make a directory called test. Oops, make sure you spell it right. And now if we type in dir again in this list, we'll see the folder test. And there it is at the bottom. Okay, so we could delete the directory if we wanted to. Uh, we can echo things, you know, echo hello world, and then it puts echoes hello world. I guess you don't need the quotation marks on when you're echoing stuff. Uh, so, but we can create a script that would make actions as to create directories and files, delete folders, delete files, uh, or anything that's repetitious. You can write a script called a batch script that will create the directories, delete directories as you need, uh, and do various other tasks. So let's do that. So I'm going to close, and the reason why I showed you command prompt is because it uses the command prompt coding language. So anything you can do in command prompt, you can turn into a, a script. You can list you know, your network configuration if you wanted to write a script that would 
you know, quickly do that. You can set your IP and do different kind of things. So it's pretty, it's very broad, the different things that you can do. So I'm going to hit the Windows key and I'm going to open Notepad. And we're just going to make our script in Notepad. So first thing I'm going to do is hit File, Save As. And I'm going to go to the desktop. And the Save As type, I'm going to change to All Files. Okay, and I'm going to call this script.bat. Now that stands for batch file. So it's important that you're not saving it as a .txt. If I have this .txt and I call it script.bat, it'll end up being called script.bat.txt. So we need the last extension to be .bat, B-A-T. So I'm ready to save that. So I'm going to hit save and we should see it pop up here on the left. So you can see it has this gear icon. It doesn't have the notepad icon that you see right here. It has this gear um icon so that lets us know that it's saving as a script so let's start writing the script so the first thing that you want to know is how to write a comment because when you're writing code it you might come back three months later and not remember what any of it does so if you write a comment you can explain what the code is doing so let's go ahead and just hit two colons and that is how you specify comments. So anything I type in here will not be executed after these two colons. So let's just say we're gonna use the at off echo command. So we'll say turn off the echo so our script will look professional. Okay, and so now we're gonna type in at echo off. So this will keep uh, the batch file from showing unnecessary text and, and we'll we'll go back and we'll turn this we'll delete this line and you'll see the difference okay now let's just do something kind of fun and let's change the color of our of our font so we're gonna say change the color of our text to red and to do that we just type in color oops color four all right and let's make another comment and what we want to do is we want to give some kind of welcome message just because I'm trying to demonstrate what you can do with batch files so we'll just say uh, echo a message that welcomes our users okay so now we're gonna type in echo uh, welcome to my first script okay we don't need quotation marks and uh, don't be confused that just because we say at echo off doesn't mean that the echo command will not work. Okay, don't be confused about that. So now let's go ahead and let's get some user input. So get user input and store into a variable. Now what we're going to do is we're going to ask the user to enter their first name and then we're going to store it into a variable that we can use later. Now Let's go ahead and use the set slash p and type in the name of the variable. And we're going to call this variable name. So if we want to refer to this later, we'll use percent name percent. So we're going to say equals and then whatever our prompt message is. So I'm going to say, please enter your first name. Okay. And then I'm doing a colon and a space. Okay. So now let's now we have the user's name because they've entered it on this line the script will not advance until this uh, variable has been set variable name so once we've set the variable name let's echo out a welcome message including the user's first name can't spell this so this first name okay so let's say echo hello and then we're going to use this variable right here so we're going to type in percent name percent. Hello, percent name percent. Um, just write something crazy. It's good to see you. Okay, sure. All right, let's run this and see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to click on the script. This will be interesting. So it's asking for our first name. So let's type in our first name. But when we press enter, the script just disappears. So is it broken? No, actually it's not. Let's add another line and say, wait for user input. Okay, so we'll type in pause. So what's happening is we're getting to this, the script is pausing, we're entering the name, then it's completing the script, echoing, and then it's exiting the script. So once the script is done, once a batch file is done, when you launch it just by clicking right here, as soon as the script is done, it exits the window. So now that we entered this pause, it'll pause right here and it'll wait for a key press. So now let's type in Paul. 
And then here you can see it echoes out, hello, Paul, it's good to see you. All right, and press any key to continue, and then it closes the screen. So let's make a directory called whatever the user enters. So if I enter Paul, let's go ahead and build a directory called Paul, all in the script. So to do that, we'll make a new line and say, create a new directory based on the user's first name. And the way to do that is just MK dr percent name percent okay that's it so now when we run the script i'm going to save the file double click the script please enter your first name paul hello paul it's good to see you close the script and here we can see it created a directory for us on the script and the script is named paul what i entered if i run this again and i name uh let's say my name is marvin <laughs> so Hi Marvin, it's good to see you. Now there's a folder for Marvin. So you can see that if I had to make 50 folders for one person, and let's just say name underscore, let's see, uh, pictures. I don't know, I'm just making something up on the fly. And say we had to make three folders for every user that we created. So I'm gonna delete these folders, and we're gonna name one pictures, music, and we'll just call the other one software. Okay. So we'll save this script, say, hello, enter your first name. Name it Paul. Hello, it's good to see you. Close the script. Now we instantly created Paul Pictures, Paul Music, Paul Software. So you can kind of see how this would be useful. Instead of having to manually create all three of these folders, we could just script it. We enter the name, and then it creates the music, the folders, the software. Okay, so there's so much more that you could do with batch scripts, but I just want to kind of give you this brief introduction because my goal with this course is to get your feet wet and point you in the right direction. So if the way you find out these commands, basically, I'll show you. Just give me a second here. Uh, let's see. Okay, pop this over here. Okay, here's Google. So let's just say change color of batch file font. How to change color of CMD with Windows Bash Script. And here we go. So you find color zero. We use color number four, and that was red. So if you don't know, if you want to know how to do something, just Google what you want to do, and nine times out of ten, it comes up and you're good to go. So we'll close out of that. And uh, that's it. So we're, I'm just going to close this script, and I'm going to delete these files because I don't need them. I go ahead and delete. Well, I guess, yeah, I'll delete the script too. Uh, so just empty my recycle bin, keep the file size small. So that is your brief introduction into batch scripting. I hope it helps you. And the goal of computers is to complete tasks for you. So we're not building, if you have to do something redundant where you have a new user come in, you have to build three folders for the user. Why not script it and have the computer do it for you instead of doing that task over and over again, okay? It kind of defeats the purpose of computers. The purpose of computers is automation. So I hope that helps you guys and I will see you in the next lecture.